Hello and welcome to the webinar. This webinar is on taking stock of organic research investments. And this is your host, Alice Formiga from the eOrganic Community of Practice at extension.org. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. We'll be reading as many questions as we can out loud after the presentation is over. So today we are very pleased to be hosting Joanna Ori, Mark Schoenbeck, and Diana Jerkins of the Organic Farming Research Foundation. They are going to be discussing the findings of some studies in which they investigated USDA-funded organic farming research, and they will also present some recommendations for strengthening organic farming research in the future. So I'm going to hand things over to Joanna Ori, who's going to be doing most of the presentations, and then we'll have Mark and Diana on a little bit later. Welcome everyone. My name is Joanna Ori and I'm so happy to be here and share some of our research with you. This is research from the Organic Farming Research Foundation and it was conducted, as you saw on the previous slide, by my colleagues Mark Schoenbeck and Diana Jerkins and I. And this research is in support of some of the core areas of our foundation. And our foundation has the mission to foster the improvement and widespread adoption of organic farming systems. We've been a organization supporting organic farmers for over 25 years. And when we were founded, the organic industry was still at its very beginning. And we've experienced tremendous growth that has inspired us to continue with our mission and our vision of having organic farming as a leading form of agriculture that will create healthy and resilient people, ecosystems, and economies. And at the core of our organization is the understanding that research is critical to agricultural advancement. Organic producers have unique challenges, and research specific to organic production is essential for organic producers. Yet, it's not only valuable for organic producers, conventional growers and others can also learn from organic practices and innovation. And so we find organic focused research to have wide applications throughout the agricultural industry. This webinar is going to focus on a report, st taking stock, analyzing and reporting organic research investment. This was undertaken in order to better understand how current research investment aligns with identified farmer needs. And we conducted an in-depth analysis of USDA-funded research. We reviewed the act of 124 ORI and 64 ORG transitions projects in order to understand where and what was being funded, as well as what areas have benefited from the programs and which topics require additional attention. We really wanted to know about the strengths and future areas that these programs can really benefit organic farmers. We interviewed uh, the project directors and farmer collaborators, and we wanted to really do a deep dive into these projects um, to answer some of our research questions. And what we found overall is that these projects have had very important contributions for organic producers. And we're going to go into more detail throughout this webinar. So before we really get into our findings, I want to just highlight what the two programs we're referring to in this webinar, what they are. So we're talking about the Organic Research and Education Initiative and the Organic Transitions Program. And in total, these programs have provided $142.2 million. So this is USDA funding going directly to organic research and education. And the National Institute of Food and Agriculture instituted the OREI program to fund research on critical organic areas. And this was created in 2002 in the Farm Bill. And it was 
brought forward because there was this very high demand for organic research. And because of this continued high demand, this OREI program has been renewed and expanded in both the 2008 and 2012 Farm Bills. The 2012 Farm Bill provides OREI with annual funding of $20 million until 2018, so coming up pretty soon, after which additional funding will be required for the program to continue. The other program that we're talking about is the Organic Tradition Transitions Program, ORG. And this program was created to support farmers making the tr transition to organic practices. And it was also uh, started in 2002. This program has received about three to $5 million each year in discretionary funds. And what that means is that the continuation of this important program remains contingent upon annual appropriations in Congress. So um, these are very important programs and uh, this webinar really is going to demonstrate the great need for the continuation of this type of USDA attention to organic issues. And the need for continued USDA support for organic research is really critical in order to help support the growth of the organic sector, which is rapidly growing. You can see that here in this chart where you see the expansion of U.S. organic sales from 2005 yeah. until 2015. Yeah. These last two years are estimated, but you can see this strong trajectory of growth, especially in areas like fruit and vegetable. Um, in 2015, the Organic Trade Association estimated U.S. organic retail sales at $43.3 billion. So this is a rapidly growing and important part of the U.S. agricultural industry. The OREI and ORG programs were created to support the, these growing needs of this expanding sector. And the benefits for growers are more important now than ever, seeing that there's this very strong demand for, for organic goods. The growing demand also highlights a need Muted. for programs to grow and support the needs of this sector. And the benefits from these programs include providing producers with new information, practical tools, and organic seeds. They also include educational opportunities for producers to learn about research, and also research pro uh, programs and findings that are still being developed, but provide a very important foundation for continued research, so future research projects that can build upon these intermediary research results. And lastly, these programs have really created new and strengthened networks of communities of practice, and these are a multidisciplinary stakeholder networks of producers, researchers, and service providers who have worked together on many of these projects as collaborators to create a very strong organic research network. I'm now going to go into some of the more specific details of our analysis. And first, I'll start with our research questions. We wanted to know about the accomplishments of the USDA programs for organic research. And so we looked at the 12, past 12 years of data to answer this question. What has been accomplished through these USDA programs? We also wanted to know, were organic research priorities addressed? This is a very important question for us. We also wanted to know, were producers engaged as equal partners in this research process? That includes from the very initial stages of finding out what kind of research questions are important to producers, to having producers involved in the actual research and the outreach. We also wanted to know, did the project yield practical outcomes for organic farmers and other stakeholders? and have these project results been effectively shared with the stakeholders and producers. So 
to answer these questions, we conducted a in-depth review. So we reviewed the abstracts of all 124 I and the 64 ORG transitions projects. We did an in-depth analysis, so we wanted more detailed information, and to do that, we conducted interviews with the principal investigators on the research projects, as well as the farmer participants. These were for selected projects, not all of them. And we also are very interested in sharing our findings from this report, so in a webinar like this one, but also at conferences, in order to get input about uh, future research needs and also how these programs have been uh, effective. We also really want to provide feedback to the USDA and have this report be a useful document. And so we have uh, been reporting back to the USDA and presenting this information. And one of our goals is also to have enhanced delivery. So having producers really know about these important project outcomes and how they might be able to be applied to their, uh, to their farms and ranches. So this analysis led us to a few very important findings. One of our questions was where and what type of entities are being funded. And so here in this table, you can see what types of recipients received grants and in which regions. Land grant universities received the majority of funding with the USDA Agricultural Research Service and nonprofits also receiving a small number of awards. The North Central region received the highest percent of funding. Here you can see that in this percent of total funding category. And that's followed by the Northeastern region and also the Western region, which had similarly about 25% of the funding. The region with the least amount of funding was the Southern region. And we see that greater future funding in the Southern region represents an important opportunity to bolster organic production in that region. Here on this next slide, you can see the statewide distribution of OREI and ORG funding. And uh, you can see that many of the awards were made in the Western region, as well as this North Central and Northeast region. So what were these projects on? We wanted to know. So we looked and we found that the types of commodities that were made, um, that the majority of them, of these projects were on organic crops with smaller numbers of projects on livestock and poultry production and crop and livestock integrated systems. Beyond the type of commodity that was being researched, we also wanted to know which priority areas were, fo were a focus for the research. And to look at that, we used information from our 2007 National Organic Research Agenda. And this is a report published by OFRF. This report was influential in guiding organic agriculture research um, it was published in an effort to inform funding agencies, universities, and farmer researchers about research needs of organic farmers. And the main areas that were highlighted in this, re research, this research agenda were the topics of soil management and organic production systems, systemic management of crop pests, organic livestock and poultry research, and crop and livestock breeding. So what we wanted to do is see out of the OREI and ORG projects, which of these priorities uh, received attention and which still remain as key areas that additional research is required. Uh, I wanted to note that in 2016, we published an update to this report which demonstrates that many of the same priority areas highlighted in the 2007 report 
remain areas for which growers greatly desire research. And so if we go to that first priority area from the 2007 report on soil health, what we found is that 65% of projects had a focus on soil health. So this was really important that this was a big focus for these projects and was meeting a, a farmer need, an identified farmer need. So the, nearly two thirds of the projects address soil fertility and nutrient management, soil life or soil quality. And these projects were usually done in conjunction with looking at crop or livestock production objectives. So looking at how so soil health practices were going to affect yield and other desired outcomes. For the next priority area, which was pest management, what we had were 48% of projects focused on weeds, 40% focused on insects, and 40% on plant pathogens. This distribution accurately reflects the high priority that organic producers place on developing more effective ways to deal with weeds without herbicides or intensive tillage. And the more majority of these projects tackled weeds, pests, and plant diseases with an integrated strategy. So they're really looking at these pest problems from a farm management strategy and how that could be incorporated into a system-based plan for the farm. For the priority of organic livestock and poultry production, we had 49 projects. And so this represents about 26% of the projects. It's a smaller pool that focused on, on this area, this priority area. And we, we identified in our National Organic Research Agenda that animal health and nutrition, pasture management, crop livestock integration, and animal health care was a very high priority for animal producers. And this, um, this is very important because the reintegration of crop and livestock production can tighten nutrient cycles, diversify rotations, reduce weeds and pests, and has been, it can be a very key and important component to sustainable organic agriculture. And because there is this smaller number here of projects that focused in this area, we would really like to see um, greater attention in future OREI and ORG um, requests for applications that would have a focus in this area. For the top, the priority topic of breeding and genetics, there were 31% of projects, so 58 projects funded. And crop breeding and variety evaluation consisted of 52 projects. So most of the breeding and genetics projects were on crop breeding. And a smaller number, eight projects, focused on livestock and poultry breeding. And, um, and this is about breed evaluation, but not specifically breeding. No projects did livestock or poultry breeding. And OREI and ORG, sub, sub, this is a substantial effort in crop breeding. Of the 52 projects that address that crop breeding, 12 established strong farmer participatory breeding networks. And these include working with crops like potato, potatoes, wheat, grains, dry beans, and other vegetables. Eight projects supported university breeders to develop corn, wheat, cotton, hops, and quinoa cultivars for organic farmers. And 24 projects included cultivar evaluation for disease and pest resistance. The remaining eight projects included two symposia on plant breeding and organic seed production and a planning grant and these were very important for creating um, a community of practice around plant breeding. And this is, this is one of the areas I want to highlight that has been extremely important and effective in terms of providing new research results and important tools for organic farmers. 
Livestock and poultry breeding and genetics comprises the other National Organic Research Agenda priority that has not thus far been effectively addressed by the USDA programs. Future OREI and ORG funding for farmer participatory breeding of livestock and poultry um, could play a very vital role in advancing organic animal agriculture. So this is an exciting opportunity to, to have more projects really focus on livestock and poultry breeding. And we're going to go into some more details about what we found as well as our recommendations. And so at this point, I would like to hand over the presentation to my colleague, Diana Jerkins. Uh, good afternoon and morning, depending on where you're located. All right, so um, in the review, the types of projects uh, we unmuted, the demuted. This was the types of crops that the funding supported, and the highest level of supporting was for vegetable crops and then fruit uh, trees and and small fruits. Uh, this is consistent with the type of organic production nationally the majority of production in vegetables. And you can see that there were very few, three projects that were funded in other areas as far as specialty crops, okay? Next slide. Uh, from an agronomic standpoint, uh, traditionally the commodity crops, soybeans, corn, and wheat receive the majority of funding and the majority of proposals that uh, grants that uh, supported those uh, different commodity crops. So in addition to vegetables, these are the next highly produced organic uh, crops and therefore received uh, substantial funding in those areas. Uh, one thing that is should be considered and reviewed is that cotton and rice, which are products, uh, crops that are increasing in demand for organic production, received only two projects funded. So this area significantly uh, is underfunded for crops that uh, are, are going to be increasing in both value and demand over time. All right. Next, yes. From a livestock standpoint, uh, much fewer uh, grants uh, were funded compared to plants. Uh, again, dairy had received the highest funding, which is appropriate for uh, the type of production nationally uh, in organic animal production uh, with milk and dairy products being in significant demand and uh, high production across the country in most of the regions. Uh, again, looking at uh, those, crop, or those uh, animal systems that uh, receive lower funding, both pork and beef, um, again, which are increasing in demand, received uh, very low funding of only two projects. Uh, moderate funding went to sheep and poultry and goats, uh, but again, uh, the number overall of livestock production was much lower, okay? I'd like to look at some of the highlights of, of the diversity in how projects worked or how the research methods and, and data collection was done. One thing that OREI and ORG does is provide for farmer funding or at least uh, a requirement that farmer participates in some level either through advisory members or on-farm research uh, to be part of these projects. So innovative farmer engagement uh, consisted of student research projects on working farms. Uh, this is in hopes that we can encourage students to look at organic uh, research as they go through their educational uh, levels and then uh, stay with organic research or as they receive their degree programs. Other types of engagement was monthly grower, agriculture professional, techno teleconferencing, and farmer uh, designed and led farm walks. In other words, on farm uh, demonstrations of organic methods and uh, what the data looked at on these projects. Uh, these were well attended by communities, uh, farmers around uh, the areas of, of the projects 
and received a lot of comments of this farmer to farmer information was a highly valued uh, form of communication. Okay. Another highlight was that uh, participation in a much needed um, breeding programs uh, received good, pro good funding and uh, well uh, developed consortiums for this, which are going to uh, uh, last much longer than the, the grant period. Exam two examples of this was organic seed program uh, that received almost $900,000 and yielded 25 new varieties, uh, which is substantial in breeding programs to, to have this number of varieties uh, develop in a short amount of time. And essential to that was the engagement of over 200 uh, farmers in the breeding programs, both to test varieties and also to see how uh, in the different regions that those breeding projects were good for uh, that particular, those particular environments. The Organic Potato Project at the University of Wisconsin funded two grants that led to uh, these uh, grower networks that, again, will be ongoing past the life of the, um, uh, the funded projects. And another outcome from the, this type of funding and collaboration is that it allowed these collaboratives to be developed and also allowed uh, folks that would not normally be working in this area to be contacted and engaged into this work. All right. Um, another highlight was integrated and holistic research approach which is vital to organic uh, uh, production because it is whole farm activities. An uh, example of this was weed management and soil quality projects that looked at multiple uh, different uh, approaches in the same project, not just a single focus or single disciplinary, so that weed management was looked at as a soil quality uh, problem and therefore improving soil quality could help in the management of weeds, and there were 43 projects that looked at this multidisciplinary, multi approach uh, to uh, research activity and program management. All right. So now let's look at some of the recommendations that came out from the review of all these projects. Uh, it was uh, one of the primary focuses of the grant, our funded grant was to provide recommendations and propose direction for consideration by USDA in future funding. Uh, loss of crop uh, genetic diversity uh, has been uh, a problem throughout uh, um, organic agriculture to be able to both receive varieties that are appropriate to, for our organic funding and uh, also appropriate to the needs and, and demands of organic practices. This has emerged as a nationwide agriculture and food security concern, and organic farmers in particular face a dwindling availability of vegetable, grain, and other crop varieties suited to their regions and to their production systems and to the market needs. With genetic engineering and other high-tech approaches yielding privately held patented seeds, Funding for classical plant breeding has, has virtually uh, decreased significantly, and the public plant breeder has become an endangered species at universities. Thus, one of the most inspiring findings of our anal analysis has been that OREI and ORG investment in farmer participatory plant breeding cultivar development has been well funded. So, our, one of our recommendations was increasing this investment, especially in public crop cultivar development for organic systems, uh, again, for the livestock health and breeding so that breeds, livestock breeds and plant breeds can be developed specific to organic needs. And as mentioned in that, um, the holistic approach that soil health, weed management, and climate change mitigation to organic systems be research be conducted in an integrated and systems approach. Okay. Other recommendations uh, was to uh, review the efficiency of large complex projects 
Uh, many of these, as we've shown, have been uh, large collaboratives uh, so that there might be a mixture of greenhouse gas, wheat, soil, cover crop, no-till approaches and, and analyzing this uh, integrated data and projects uh, have been large. But there have been also significant smaller projects that lead to uh, farmer ready adaptable at practical outcomes. So there needs to be a mixture of both the large term and then the small, very uh, specific uh, questioned uh, projects. There's an adherence to sustainable organic agriculture principles and practices that need to be met within the projects themselves and how they conduct those projects. Uh, as well as meeting the rules and regulations of uh, the national organic rules. And these should be a criteria also not only in how the projects are managed, but also in the proposal review. They're unmuted. Enhanced accessibility and delivery of farmer ready projects. Uh, this is a, a criteria that these projects should be uh, approached as uh, research that is needed from the basics, but also to uh, have available ready outcomes that farmers can adopt. And these products can be seen uh, through the eOrganic uh, webinars and through other accessible venues. And this should be done, this educational opportunity should be done both during the projects and beyond the life of the grant. And that NIFA should announce planning grant awards as early as possible to allow these teams to be developed because it takes anywhere from one to two years for collaboratives uh, to be created and have time to write full proposals. Okay. We want to encourage the continued innovative approaches uh, to allow for farmer engagement. It is so critical to have farmers as part of, of the team, uh, again, both from the beginning of the projects uh, to and conception and, and deciding what questions should be considered in these projects. It's, a, it's an exciting time for farmers to be involved. More and more farmers are asking to be involved and have opportunities uh, to participate in these programs and also then to test and see how the outcomes can be done on farm sites. Uh, funding for proposals from upper underrepresented commodities. We already noted that the animals in general is underrepresented, but also particular uh, pork and beef. And then again, in the plants, the rice and the cotton, and an increase in animal breedings. And again, uh, Joanna showed in the regionality of where things were funded that there are underserved regions, for example, the southern region and minority const constituents that um, would some way be given priority uh, for uh, appropriate proposals. Okay. So we need to significantly increase the funding for research that assists farmers in adopting new practices. Uh, we need to enhance both the sustainability and economic viability for our organic operators. Um, both go in hand, and that is the definition of sustainability. It's an exciting time to be talking about these opportunities since we are coming to the reauthorization of the Farm Bill, and we're optimistic that the value of investing in research to support innovative and economic opportunities for our nation's farmers, particularly the organic farmers, will have a priority in the Farm Bill that will be authorized. Okay. So we would like to acknowledge our funding uh, funders for this research. Uh, NIFA did provide funding uh, for the review of their programs, and we appreciate that. Uh, we had an advisory team of farmers and educators and other organic organizations that support the growth of the organic industry and uh, are farmer related. And we appreciate their time in reviewing and advising in this project. So now we would like to open up into uh, questions. Uh, also, uh, we, um, you can find in addition to this webinar, uh, other resources uh, that are on the OFRF.org uh, site, uh, including this Taking Stock Report, which goes into great
hear about today, uh, the National Organic uh, Review that was done by OFRF from a farmer's perspective of research needs and then the abstracts uh, now um, that we're working on the Organic Agriculture Soil Health Symposium uh, and accepting proposals for people in uh, that at the Tri-Society meeting that would like to um, provide a paper to that symposium. We also have the Organic Farming Research Foundation grant database that shows uh, information from the grants that we have funded and the results from those and of course our newsletter. Uh, we're also in the process of doing a subset of the ORI and ORG on soil health and in more detail review of those so that uh, those uh, reviews will be coming out uh, probably in about a month. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. any questions? So everyone's here, okay. and um, so we're going to move on to the questions. What I know Joanna mentioned that um, you share the data with the USDA, and so um, someone was wondering what the USDA does with your data, and um, what is this research used for on the USDA side? Um, I, this Diane, I can I can uh, take that question. Uh, we have done several presentations to uh, NIFA on the results, both from the formal uh, publication of the Taking Stock Report and also uh, to their staff there uh, on an annual basis. Uh, they already have uh, received and acknowledged many of the um, proposed um, changes that we, we have suggested and uh, changing some of the RFA. For example, uh, I believe it was last year they um, put in a priority for uh, southern region um, applications. So they are incorporating some of these as they feel best into the RFA process and also into how they uh, develop priorities within the RFA and make decisions for funding both procedurally and topically. Okay. Um, oh, I, this I'm is, sorry. Yeah, I just want to quickly add that um, the uh, priority on the southern region has been in there for been in the RFA for the last several years, but it was during the 2015 and 2016 awards that we did see quite an uptick in representation of the southern region. So that uh, that has. Um, this, you know, that, that, that imbalance has been addressed, as far as I can see, to a pretty fair extent the last two years. Okay, great. Um, I know, speaking of regions, um, when you were talking about how the different regions are funded and the different states are funded, um, does did you compare that with the number of certified organic farms or the number of organic acres in those states to sort of see how that matches up? Uh, we actually did, um, and in fact, it it did. Um, the uh, census data did show that in the southern region there were fewer organic and fewer organic sales. And there's two ways to look at this and say, well, that therefore the research need is less. So on the other hand, it could be that the research need is more because it's more difficult to go organic in uh, the warm, humid climates and the uh, less fertile soils we have in the southeast versus or the southern region versus say, the North Central, and I, uh, uh, that's an interesting question. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. If there's more research on organic systems in the South, it'll become that, you know, if those start producing practical results, that begins to facilitate the expansion of, of organic in our region, and there's a lot of potential that's just not yet quite realized, and I think we're beginning to see this uh, through the increased uh, funding of uh, projects in our region. I say Alex, I'm in Virginia. Okay, great. Um, are you developing strategies to show impact even beyond organic um, versus conventional farming with our forthcoming farm bill? And what is the plan to show value and need by all farmers? That is a really good question. I mean, certainly sustainable practices that protect resources and improve soil um, and that are economically viable are going to help all farmers and will certainly strengthen the overall food and agricultural system in the, in, in the country. 
uh, even if a farmer chooses not to be organic, uh, wants to be able to use um, synthetic chemicals as a last resort, if is really needed, uh, some of the research that's coming out of uh, these programs. For example, one of the breeding pro, one of the breeding networks, the ones focusing on corn, they have made good progress towards breeding varieties of corn that are incredibly more nitrogen efficient and even fix some of their own nitrogen through uh, association with soil organisms. And if these actually become uh, available to farmers, uh, I don't know what conventional farmer wouldn't be interested in a variety of corn that they wouldn't have to put 180 pounds of nitrogen as anhydrous ammonia, wouldn't have to worry about uh, regulatory issues with the water quality, and would be saving gobs of money on all that nitrogen if, if they only needed 60 pounds or only needed, you know, some slow-release nitrogen, you know, et cetera. So this, I think the, the, uh, the findings have wide applicability. Let's see. So do you think... Um is have, have we have you done anything to make the case for continued OREI and ORG funding and support? Um, I have not been directly involved in the advocacy. I guess my my uh, uh, in recent months, uh, I certainly think that this will provide uh, that this research that this analysis will provide a foundation to make that case. Um, you know, it's pretty really hard on a short term. Go ahead. Go speak to it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can address that also. We are very excited to have this report and these findings be at the foundation of our advocacy work. We have um, a policy associate in Washington, D.C., and we are actively working to meet with policymakers and the um, in Congress to try and have these priorities represented in the future farm bill. And so that's going to be a very important focus for the Organic Farming Research Foundation coming up um, in, the, in the close future and, and currently as well. And so I'll we have, also give an, sorry. Oh, please, please go, Diana. I'll also give an example. Just last night, we, uh, our policy associate and myself, uh, attended a reception uh, at the congressional uh, offices to, uh, amongst others, that uh, did provide research. And we highlighted this report and the results from this. Uh, and this uh, was in order to uh, provide a greater amount of information to. Um, congressional and, and staff in D.C., and it was well attended, and uh, so there were many questions asked about uh, the results of this report, and, and uh, again, the intent was specifically to encourage continued support of organic funding, research funding, as well as uh, helping them to understand uh, what organic is all about. Okay, great. Um, what research area do you think has had the most impact on organic producers? That's really hard to say at this point. Uh, although a lot of emphasis has been on the area of soil health and weed management um, and reduced tillage and how that links to carbon sequestration, a lot of that is asking very large questions and is maybe in the category of intermediary research. And on the other hand, there's, uh, I would say, some of the breeding networks have had quite a bit of direct impact just because of how well they engage farmers in addition to the fact that a significant number of new varieties are coming out. Um, and there have been a few cases where some very simple innovations. Uh, there was one example. Uh, there's a study on, on just organic blueberry production and different mulching systems and different uh, nutrient weed management systems in the Pacific Northwest for blueberries and blackberries. And this one farmer said, well, why don't we just lay the weed mat so that there's a, a seam down the center right in the crop row, and then anytime you want to add something to the soil to build soil health or provide nutrients, you can pull it back, do it, and put it back. And it was such a simple thing, and it's now being adapt adopted by quite a few growers in the network. Uh, there's another grower who, uh, with the support of the ORI project, was able to propose and conduct uh, trials on a modified crop rotation to deal with a particular weed that was very problematic. Uh, so those are a couple of examples, uh, and I'm sure 
that there has been increased, uh, there are some general themes, you know, uh, consistent trends towards certain practices improving soil health and um, some of the uh, performance uh, parameters of the system, such as weed management and uh, crop nutrition, uh, things like extending the rotation to include a perennial uh, sod phase. Uh, it is really hard to estimate from the reports that I was working with to uh, help develop this analysis exactly how much adoption has occurred so far. However, I would say that thanks to eOrganic itself, there is a tremendous amount of information available uh, to the farmers and to uh, ag professionals, anybody who wants to just uh, get on and look at these different webinars about um, cover crop systems, et cetera. Um, it's hard to estimate how much impact, but I would, uh, I would expect it would be substantial. Okay. Uh, Alice, can I, Alice, can I add to that? Not direct research results, but one thing, two things that have come out of this peripherally is how much farmer interest there are from conventional growers uh, in organics now. And they're wanting to, to know uh, how these practices and principles work. And so this has come out in, in talking to farmers and having farmers part of these collaboratives. And the other outcome has been to acknowledge and encourage across the board in agriculture the need for uh, supporting new and transitioning farmers. And so that's not been direct research results, but that's been the acknowledgement of some areas that are very critical that will support research in the future. Okay, um, you talked about the different um, National Organic Research Agenda reports that you have and um, that some of the priority areas are st um, s still needed um, for more organic research. And does that mean that those priority research areas weren't addressed or does it mean that there's still a need for more research in those areas? I would say that the uh, livestock breeding is an area that had not been addressed as of 2014. Um, I do recall uh, scanning through the 15 and 16 uh, project. There was at least one specifically organic livestock breeding, so I was really excited to see that. Uh, on the other topics, it's just that um, the whole conundrum of how do you manage weeds when you aren't using herbicides and you have to rely on steel, which entails soil disturbance, how do you manage weeds adequately and still build and maintain soil health? It's a tough question. And soil health and weeds came out at the top of the 2015 uh, review, which came out as the 2016 NORA uh, National Organic Research Agenda. And all that is saying to me is that this work needs to continue and we need to keep a practical focus and keep farmers really engaged uh, I, I think there's some real progress being made in this area. Not only are there new weed management tools that are kinder to the soil and just as effective at keeping the weeds down, uh, but I think there is an increasing understanding of how to integrate uh, cover crops, organic inputs, and uh, practical means to reduce tillage. Uh, you're not going to eliminate all tillage in an organic system, but you're going to be able to reduce it quite substantially and uh, allow a considerable improvement in soil health. So um, I think progress is being made, but it's, it's a big project. And although 140 million sounds like a lot of money, or, uh, it is actually a relatively modest investment. So um, I would just say that that was just a green light to saying, yes, this is helpful, we need, we need more. I, I think I'll add a little bit to that. So our 2016 National Organic Research Agenda was based on a survey that we did with far organic farmers throughout the country. And we had over a thousand farmers participate in that survey. So we have this very rich data source of what the biggest challenges are for growers. And what we found is that, as Mark said, these topics of soil health and weed management remain very pressing in terms of where farmers need more research. And so these, uh, these are complex questions and um, they're still very much desired in terms of new research that can help farmers understand these 
uh, how to best manage soil health and weeds. Um, soil health was the number one priority that came out of that survey. Okay. Um, how do you um, think that this current administration will address organic? Um, do you have a sense of whether it will be in a positive way or whether um, they will try to build additional barriers? Ah, uh, tough question. Um, I'm concerned, to be perfectly honest, and I'm really glad to hear that uh, Diana and uh, our uh, policy associate, our OFRF policy associate, have been working closely and had a good reception um, at that congressional hearing because um, I think what we need to do, since we have such a business-minded administration right now, we need to frame sustainable and organic practices as good business. I mean, it is good business to save and build your soil. It is good business to spend one-third as much on nitrogen if you're non-organic or organic. Uh, the, a lot of aspects of this uh, it can be reframed that way, even um, even uh, climate mitigation itself, because if you're whether you believe that the climate is changing or not, if you're pulling carbon out of the air and putting it back in the soil and improving soil quality, you're going to be um, making it easier for farmers to make a living. So that's a kind of a way that, it, that, it, that we could reframe this. And, um, you know, our current, our current president was elected to a large extent on the strength of uh, rural and other um, middle income, lower income people who wanted to have better opportunities. And we could frame organic and sustainable farming uh, in terms of this is expanding opportunities in rural America. I mean, it may be a stretch, but that's how I'm looking at it. Okay. Um, are the NOP and FSMA proposed suggested changes ever considered for a priority, such as investigating hydroponics or the impact of compost age and E. coli? I don't know how much to say on hydroponics. It doesn't seem, I mean, I tend to agree with those this is a personal viewpoint that it really doesn't come under the aegis of organic because it, it um, and the organic is a soil based system in my viewpoint. And that's just opinion. Uh, the whole question of FISMA and, and food safety, uh, there were several newer uh, projects in the last few years that are still in progress where they're looking at the capacity of healthy soils with a, with a fully functioning soil food web to attenuate pathogens. And this can include compost age, can include how, how the manure is managed and as it becomes compost or becomes incorporated into the soil system. Um, I, I think that that's a positive development and, and it, it's an area where ORI and OR can contribute to food safety rules and guidelines that are both uh, practical and accessible to the farmer and effective in, in protecting uh, consumer health and public health. Okay. Are Hawaii and the U.S. Pacific territories considered a priority region similar to the southern areas that you mentioned? Oh, good question, because uh, they're actually part of the western region, and there were one or two projects that came out of there, but not that many. Uh, anybody else want to answer? Uh, Diana, Joanna, do you have some more um, insight on this? I can uh, respond to that a bit. In our National Organic Research Agenda, we had quite a few respondents from Hawaii, and um, and I think that there are definitely specific and uh, unique needs to those regions, and it is a, a priority to to meet those. Um, and so, um, while that isn't something that was expected expressly added to this report or to our National Organic Research Agenda. It's something that we've collected data on, and it would be a really interesting thing to look at what those unique challenge areas might be for Hawaii and how to best address them. And we have that data, and um, I'm very happy to follow up with anyone who is interested in looking at that if you want to contact me directly. 
Okay. Um, does your analysis reveal at which stage certain commodities or regions become represented? That is, are there fewer proposals to start with in certain areas, or does project selection create that disparity? Uh, that is a good question that was brought to my attention in the process of developing our report. Uh, and I believe um, that in the area of uh, animal breeding and livestock projects in general, uh, there may well be fewer research teams and fewer proposals being submitted. And that may even also be true to some extent or have been in the past uh, relating to the southern region. That may be it may be that there were fewer proposals coming from the southern region rather than a, a bias on the part of the reviewers. Um, in fact, I think the only area that I find myself wondering if there may be an unconscious bias in the review process is the preference for really large projects over some of the, the simpler projects. Uh, because in the early days of the program, there were a number of small, small, I say small, like in the range of fifty to 500,000 budgets that really accomplished a surprisingly large amount, you know, really made big progress. And then some of these very, very big projects that try to take on many, many, many factors, uh, they tend to produce more intermediary outcomes and relatively less farmer ready. And so when you read a proposal that really covers everything, tries to tackle everything, it can sound more exciting than a small, simple project that says, oh, well, let's look at, for example, Soybean aphid, which is an invasive pest from Asia, uh, and whether a rye cover crop influences the soybean susceptibility. And that was a very simple project, and they found, yes, it did. And that growing a rye cover crop can help reduce the problem. Very simple question, very simple answer. And on the other hand, uh, when you're looking at all the different factors in soil health and weed management and, you know, throwing a little bit of uh, carbon sequestration, that can look very exciting, but it's biting off such a large... Uh, amount, I, you know, I, we actually heard back from some of the uh, PIs that said if we can make some of these projects a little more simple, it may actually be more cost effective. So um, that's a really interesting question. And I kind of went on a tangent, but that's the only area that I had a sense that the bias may be in the review process. I kind of believe what um, that in the case of commodities and um, and, the, and, and regions, perhaps, and topics, that it may be quite a bit a function of how many proposals and how many really strong proposals came. But that, again, is all just an educated guess. Um, let's see. The research on soil, oh, this is a comment, the research on soil health and organic is very much in demand by all farmers, and I've not seen the evaluation, but I'm sure the value is as great for conventional farmers as for organic farmers. So you said that you're going to be um, talking about uh, producing a more detailed report on um, soil health research. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. In fact, I'm helping OIPARF on that one, too. Excellent. OK. I'm working Great. on yeah, I'm working on contract. But it's yeah, very exciting work. I'm looking yeah. forward to well, getting back. We, look, we look forward to getting the word out about it. So um, let's see. Yeah. A couple more questions here. We still have some time. So feel free to type in any more. Um, have you also looked into research on the effects of policy on organic or sustainable agriculture producers? Is there a report on gaps, barriers, et cetera, that arise from national or state policies? There were a very few projects that touched on policy analysis, and probably the most, the closest approach to that was one um, that whose project pro whose project product was a manual on organic contracts to help far organic farmers read and uh, decide on contracts offered by uh, buyers. Now, that really isn't government policy. Um, I know that there were a few years when the RFA specifically asked for policy analysis, and, and I think policy analysis was continued, contained in the legislative priorities for uh, the ORI. However, that is an area where there have not been very many uh, projects and may and maybe again be a matter of not very many proposals. Uh, Diana and Joanna? I, I, I can just add that 
there's great value in those types of questions. And um, Mm -hmm. it's something that the Organic Farming Research Foundation is very interested in. We um, have been doing a bit of work and are interested in doing more, looking at how some of the support for organic transition um, might affect growers and adoption of organic practices. And um, within our own grant making, we have created a new priority area in our last RFP for social science and policy-based work. And so that's something that we really hope to support and and see grow in the future. Okay. Um, Out of all the priorities discussed, what areas do you think needs the most work and additional research? Um, Well, I do think the uh, areas of plant and livestock breeding, both. I mean, the livestock breeding, we really need to take that one up. Um, the more I looked at some of these research findings and thought about it, the more it became clear that plant and animal genetics are a huge missing link for sustainable and organic systems. That when you're trying to grow a crop that has been developed in an intensively managed conventional systems that receive lots of soluble fertilizers that, you know, had unlimited access to synthetic chemicals for plant and or animal health protection, that you are not selecting for organisms, uh, crop plants and and, uh, livestock that would thrive in the most sustainable organic systems. Uh, And I think there is even a potential to improve crops capacity to uh, thrive in organic minimum till systems, for instance, which have been shown to be the most effective in soil health, but not always the most effective in supporting crop yields. Uh, so that's one big area that I'd like to see uh, more investment. And uh, looking at the soil health and the weed management, uh, and also other pest management, and also Uh, climate mitigation and adaptation, basically carbon sequestration, reducing emissions, and increasing system resilience. All of those need more work, and um, two things I think we could increase. On the one hand, more emphasis on what is practical, and trying to come up with things that farmers can use really soon. And again, that may involve some of the smaller, more targeted projects where we have a particular component to the system that is worth trying out. On the other hand, one of the things that we did recommend is to take the large amount of intermediary data that has been accumulated on these areas, like the greenhouse gas footprint and soil health and weed management and organic systems, and it would be good to fund a few teams to conduct meta-analysis, like a formal analysis across a range of other projects. Uh, The work I'm doing now on soil health uh, the deeper dive in soil health with OFRF is more of an informal analysis. But meta-analysis is a more formal statistical approach where you can really take a number of existing studies and really extract and identify uh, robust trends that can then become the basis for uh, practical recommendations. So those are some areas that I think could uh, use some more attention. Okay. Um, can you share any information um, about um, let's see, wait, let me find the question. I just kind of skipped forward there. Can you share any information to find any reports on this research you discuss about compost and soil health? Compost and soil health. Yeah. Um, well, I'm hoping that the work that we're doing with um, OFRF is it, actually a private foundation funding this additional work on soil health and, and organic research. Um, I would, well, first thing, I would go to the eOrganic website and look under their for, uh, soil management and fertility uh, section. Yeah, uh, fact, eOrganic can, has a page on extension. Uh, that's a re- yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I can certainly send the person afterwards a list of some of the webinars we have on the OREI project that address these yeah. things. Um, and we probably also have a list of the soil health projects and then I can kind of see if we've got any um, articles from those projects. So I can certainly send the person that after the webinar. Um, but I think we've yeah. got time. And when, yeah. these new, when, when these new projects, when um, these new reports come out, they will contain literature reviews and uh, 
some summary information on just those kinds of questions, uh, and the compost will be addressed. There won't be a separate uh, uh, report on compost. If you go into the nutrient management in soil health, that'll focus a lot on uh, how different types of compost uh, affect uh, both crop nutrition and overall soil health, and how the compost applications interact with other practices such as crop rotation, cover crops, and reducing tillage to uh, build of health, uh, soil health and fertility. And the other place to go is the, um, the Chris abstracts. Uh, you could search on a specific project. If you know a specific project that is conducted in this area and want, want to get uh, uh, a look at their summary report. Some of these reports are quite informative and some less so. They're a little bit uneven in quality. And in fact, that was one of our recommendations to uh, USDA and the programs is to um, encourage uh, investigators or encourage project recipients to become more consistent in delivering reports that really nicely summarize the meat of their results. Yeah, I think Sarah um, does a really good job with that, for example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see an analogous website for ORI and ORG, and that's one of the things we, we suggested. Okay, um, great. I'm going to ask a final question here. I hope I can read it correctly. It says, for the sake of the Farm Bill, the Soil Health Report, could it pool cross-value of research findings for organic and conventional, um, the current info on food safety and how compost is being regarded for soil health and food safety? So... I'm not sure if you understand that question, but it sounds like it would well, be it was, good to integrate those. I got, those I got a little lost in it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's, it's just sort of the phrasing. I just, um, I think that um, the person is interested that you would mention how compost is being regarded for soil health and food safety um, uh -huh. in the reports for all these projects. Well, I think around food safety, uh, there's fairly high standards for the amount of heat and the thoroughness of exposing all parts of the heat to that heat. I think it's like 131 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 days with five turns is the, um, uh, is the NOP, National Organic Programs definition of compost, anything that has not been treated to that level and it contains animal manure, other animal waste, you know, like paunch manure or whatever, uh, slaughterhouse uh, byproducts, et cetera. Those things have to be treated as raw manure and, and that 120 day waiting period uh, observed. What I can see from the food safety research, that's a reasonable guideline to really get rid of like 95, 99% of the risk. You never get 100% risk free unless you don't use uh, organic materials at all, but uh, you're going to get the risk way, way down with that kind of interval. And um, so I would say that you know this is a this is an important area and I, I do think there is some some uh, good solid research going on uh, both within ORI and uh, broader across USDA uh, that will help us get to refining those guidelines okay um, there is that there's that yeah. one last thing there is that sure. indirect effect that the healthier your soil on the, on the on the average the healthier and more biologically active and diverse your soil, the shorter the half-life of a nasty pathogen is going to be in that soil. And there are specific examples where that didn't hold 100%, so the more research is needed to optimize how we can develop soils that will attenuate human pathogens. And then there's some research going on that area, too, so it's all pretty exciting, promising. Okay. Um, okay, I have a comment here. It says, I'm in Tennessee and we're starved for organic how-to um, information applicable for the South. A huge barrier to us is tillage, not an option. I'm not sure if you mean reduced tillage is not an option for organic in the South on larger farms. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> That's very well stated. I mean, that's true. That's why we need more organic research in the South. Okay. Um, but just do, duly noted, okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and then we have a final question. Somebody wants to know how the price of organic food can be reduced. Hmm. 
uh, I will take a pass on that. I'm much of an economist, <laughs> and uh, if uh, if others on the call have some insight, that's a good question. I would just add that I have often struggled with the conundrum: How do we make sure that all in this country can be fed good, nutritious food and enough of it as a basic human right, and make sure that every farmer who is diligently pursuing his or her profession of growing food for us all and make a decent living. That's a big conundrum, not just in organic, but in across farming. So, um, again, good question. Okay. Well, we are out of time, um, but I'd like to thank everyone for all the great questions that were submitted. So thank you so much, Joanna, Diana, and Mark for presenting this research today. And um, just as a reminder about the report, you can find it on the Organic Farming Research Foundation website, as well as their other reports. And um, we were very grateful to be able to help publicize the findings of this report today and look forward to working with you on future webinars. So thanks to everyone for joining us.